as you go forward in this week. So, anything that came out that we need to pray for? I mean, we've got the plenty of folks and still that are weather affected in their situation. We've got the folks here with uh, health issues of different kinds and stuff. With Gary and Connie and Billy and you know even Jeannie and his families. They care for you know, families and uh, member members of their family and all. So there's lots of things around us here. To anything else that anybody has that we need to pray for. All right, Harry, would you mind leading us in prayer, please, before we start? Again, Father, we're thankful for another first day of the week. We're especially thankful, Father, for Jesus. And may we remember all phases of his life. And may we become more like him in the way we think and talk and live. Again, bless our study together this morning and may we glean the lessons we should from the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Again, thank you for Jesus. His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, my intent over the next few weeks is to We've got some of the minor prophets that God shared with us. There are only two and three chapters. Uh, it's my hope, uh, my intent right now is to take some of those, uh, Nahum, Habakkuk, Nehemiah, or Zephaniah and some of them, and do those in one week. Uh, if you've been here this whole time with me, that's a real challenge to me, <laughs> to do a whole thing in one week. Because, man, there's, God really shares some 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 neat things to us uh, or with us in those minor prophets but that's where I'm going to go uh, next week I will be out uh, Florence and I will be traveling to Nashville Monday or Tuesday depending on how she gets off of work tomorrow morning and all that stuff uh, to deliver our boxes uh, to Healing Hands International and talk to those folks so uh uh, please pray for whoever will be receiving those boxes those boxes will probably be going to Honduras I don't know the congregation. When I asked the gentleman down there about what congregation, he said, well, we actually have 40 or 50 that we interact with and go, and right now I really don't have a lead on which one. So they were going to Honduras, but which congregation down there uh, is not known at this time with it. So please pray for those boxes and how God will use those to touch lives down there. Then again, we're set for May 21st for our Walk for Water uh, that will probably be someplace in Africa where a whale gets drilled. But if we, however much money we earn, we can impact that and the people there with that. But in my absence next Sunday, while I'm out, uh, Harry will be teaching. So uh, I'm grateful to him already for his willingness to do that. So please come back next Sunday. Harry will be leading our discussion in our Bible class next week. Today we're going to go to Nahum. Anybody ever hear that book before? You ever read it? It seems sort of uh, an odd book to study today after yesterday. Yesterday we celebrated the birth of our Master and our Lord Jesus. Today we go to Nahum. And Nahum is singularly fixed on Nineveh. That's his only topic. That's he's there. It's actually beautiful Hebrew poetry and the way it's written. Uh, there's poetry throughout Old Testament books and stuff, but Nahum is really very good poetry. So if you want to look at it just from a literary point of view, it can give you a good feel for how poetry is done and written. But his message is pretty ugly. You think of any other book we've looked at already that spoke about Nineveh? Jonah. Huh? Jonah. Jonah. That old willing prophet back there, right? Huh? As long as you do it my way and send me where I want to go, I'm, I'm on your bandwagon. Let's go. But to go to Nineveh, you've got to be kidding. You know, those wicked people up there, why would I go to Nineveh? But he eventually went. But the book of Jonah actually has a little bit of compassion and a little bit of sense of love and concern for the people of Nineveh, right? And God sort of, you know, why shouldn't I be concerned, man? If, they ought to hear, if they repent, 
And Jonah knew, yeah, man, if they repent, then you're, you're not going to be harsh on them, man. You're going to save them. You're going to do good for them. Those people don't deserve any of that stuff. That was Jonah's mindset, right? But in chapter 4, we see what happened. And Jonah, Jonah pre preached. The people responded, right? That's great stuff. Isn't that why we live the Christian life? Isn't that why we have us to encourage each other as members, if you will, of God's army to go out and be able to take God's story of love out to the world so they can be saved? Nineveh changed. But, unfortunately we have to say, but, Nineveh, way up here, huh? way over here is Israel, okay? But Nineveh rules the world, okay? They are the one, they are the nation who conquered Israel, okay? They had a plan set to say, we want to conquer the entire world as we know it. The imperialistic plan, they said, everywhere we can go, we will go. And we will take out everybody, we will rule, Okay? Nineveh was thought to be impregnable. Where it sits, I understand, there's the Tigris River, there's another, it's K-H-O-R, so I'll just call it Kor River, but it actually goes through, and gates around it going. Huge city. If you remember from Jonah, he talks about three days he tripped to cross the city. That's huge. Even in nowadays time, that's huge. But think back then, they didn't have cars. You know, like we have now to go from one end to the other. They had to hoof it. Or maybe, you know, you had a donkey or a horse or something like that to go on. But most of the time, it's, you're on your feet, you know. That's one of those amazing things that came back to me yesterday, you know. Man, right after Mary got the prophecy, she's going to be the mother of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Where does she go? To visit her cousin Elizabeth. 60 miles? 14 or 15 year old girl, 60 miles to visit that's a long way to go, you know? However long it took her to get there. But Nineveh's way up here, okay, to Israel. This doesn't show another city, but down here in Upper Egypt, there was another town that's mentioned in the scriptures coming up, Thebes. Have you ever heard of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt? All the great pyramids and uh, collections, if you will, tucked to Haman and his grave and all that stuff, that was all down here. Thebes also thought themselves to be impregnable. Nile River on the east side, mountains on the west side. I didn't get it. Nobody get in here. Can't get it. All right? Well, Shalbanser was the king of, of Nineveh when they took over Israel. A few years later, a guy by the name of Ashurbanipal came in and he said, ah, you think you're impregnable? We'll show you. He went and took Thebes. They're mentioned here in, in Nahum as well, okay? But Nineveh, a very ugly city, and that's where it comes. But the book of Nahum, Nahum, oddly enough, the word means, his name means comfort. He says very little about comfort in his book, okay? The only idea of comfort in most of the things I read was the Jewish people would feel comforted because their arch enemy, Nineveh, has gotten finally some punishment for the way they handled people. Okay? That's the main idea behind the book of, of Nahum. He said, Nineveh, you've been doing what you've done for years and years. You've conquered people. And in doing that, you've shown a complete disdain for human life. You have no respect for humans at all. Now, some of the stories are, I reach back trying to read history from here, there, and whatever I could just to see what kind of descriptions. And most of it was just sort of ugly. Okay? But that's not anything new to our world, is it? Go back to some of the ways, I guess in my book, and it's just amazing how much money we spend even today learning to destroy ourselves as human beings. If we were to turn all that money put into military weapons and might into taking care of each other, we'd probably be able to solve most of the problems that we as human beings have. But instead of that, we'd rather, how is it I can be ugly to each other, okay? Just go back as far as Vietnam, and my, that was the one while I was a teenager. 
I had some friends whose dads went to Vietnam. Not pretty at all when you see some of the things that come, you know? The way the Viet Cong would handle people, some of the traps and tools they set up, they're not meant, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're meant to hurt you and let you suffer as long as you can suffer before you die, you know? Go back a few years from that. My dad spent a few years in Korea. Not a real nice place either. We still struggle with the North Koreans, right? But some of the things they had, you know, I've just learned a whole lot more about what my dad did and all that stuff because he would never talk to us about what he did even after he retired and all that. But since he died and the things I've got in cleaning out some of his stuff and all that stuff, he was in Air Force Intelligence. That's why he never told us what he did. That's why every now and then they'd pick him up on a Saturday morning at 5 or 6 o'clock, blindfold him, put him in a truck and take him out. And as he put it, he was there. They said... You're here, meet us here at such and such a time. You know, it's the only time I ever saw him with a gun. He brought a gun in, he put it in his closet, take it out when they got him. You never saw him with it, but he knew how to use it. Sure didn't want to mess with him when it come to wrestling and all that kind of stuff he wanted to. So what he did over there while he was in Korea, probably don't really want to know. Go back to... World War II, it's probably one of the best ones most all of us can get at, right? Hitler, such a nice gentle soul, right? Sweet leader of Germany. Just heard a message this morning and stuff, listening to it and all that stuff about a survivor of one of the prison camps. Actually got taken to Auschwitz and was fortunate to be rescued before went to the Chambers and stuff there. We could probably come up with all kinds of stories, right? About how ugly we can be to each other. That's what Nahum tells us about. The people of Nineveh and how they treated people. And therefore God's time to say that it's over. Okay? 663 to 612 about is where they say that Nahum uh, prophesied. 612 is when Nineveh, Nineveh fell. Uh, Medes and the Babylonians got together, came up and took Nineveh. 612 is when they fell. Most people believe that the prophecies that, Nahum, that are recorded in Nahum probably took place somewhere in the 650 to 640 range. Could have gone down as close as 620. But they were in the last few years that Nineveh existed as a, the leader of Assyria and the Assyrian nation actually existed. So they've gone this time. It's about 100 years after Jonah had preached. The people repented. The people turned. Even the king of Assyria. Remember what it said to him when Jonah? He did what? As a symbol of his repentance, if you will. He put on sackcloth. Sat in ashes. The king of this Assyria did that. Such a proud people, arrogant people. And yet the king in Jonah, he put on sackcloth. And he encouraged his people to do the same. And God gave them mercy. But, so we have to ask that question, could that happen to us? Let's see the burden against Nineveh, Nahum starts. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. Now that's another good one. Where is Elkosh? Nobody knows. Some of the people, if you will, ancient church fathers actually said there's an all Nash town up here just north of Nineveh. I couldn't find enough to support that. Some people said it was up in Galilee area. And then the other best one that people like is it's actually near where Micah was born in, in southern Judah. Since Judah is the part of Israel that still exists at this time, most people would say that's probably where it was. But where it actually is, no one's ever found. No one actually knows. So can't tell you that for sure where it is. If you go out, okay, Nineveh speaks of in here saying you know, where it is and how that's going. 
But when it was destroyed, it's like they wipe it out, just a mound. That was true. After it, they wiped it, I mean, it was like pfft, gone. And it wasn't until the late 1800s, 1880, 1890, that somebody actually found, the archaeologists looking and stuff, actually found part of the remnants of Nineveh. So there are places now where you could actually go over there and find it. It's near Mosul. You ever heard of that in Iraq? That, that name came up several times while we were over there, our military and stuff, and the conflicts and stuff over there. The actual remnants of Nineveh are just not far from that town, that current city over there. Huge city we talked about before, okay? Several hundred. The inner city where the palace was is said to have had walls where you could put four chariots side by side going across that wall. 50 to 100 feet tall. Can you imagine that? Building something like that? Hand by hand, you know, or whatever basic tools you could come up with. Okay? And out from there, they had another wall around it, plus the rivers on one side, Tigris River on one side, that somebody would have had to come across to get anywhere near it. Mountains on the back side, just like Thebes is described in Egypt. So that's some of that background. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges, it says in verse 2. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. Think God's angry? The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will not at all acquit the wicked. Good thing to remember, right? Notice he's speaking again to people that at one time had repented. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. Anything particular about those places? To the Jew, Bashan and Carmel sit right out here and go out into the, into the Mediterranean, basically, if you will. Very fruitful places for the land of Israel. Okay? For growing their crops, rich crops would come out of that region. He says in there, they're going to wither, okay? That's how bad it's going to be. And Nineveh had water all around it for where it was placed. Two rivers come together, stuff right in the foot of the mountain, so they could, you know, pretty well, a good supply of water for that place, but it's going to wither. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves in his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Can you imagine what it would be like? To meet God in his anger when he steps down? Anybody here ever been in an earthquake? In the mountains? How is it? Well, fortunately, when I was far enough away, it only shook stuff off the shelves. But I was in Cuba when the big quake in Haiti happened a few years back. Huh? But yeah, you can feel it. Sort of scary, huh? I was in Alaska in 1964 when the earthquake hit Anchorage up there. Uh, my school was called Government Hill Elementary. Uh, it sat on a hill, I'll call it, I guess, a part of a mountain right above the train station. The train station up there was pretty highly used. It had between 10 and 20 tracks that were pretty active. When the earthquake finished, my elementary school was on the railroad tracks instead of on the mountain. The main street of town four-lane track going through Anchorage at the time. Okay. The main street of town split right in half down the whole yellow line. I mean, almost you couldn't have carved it out any better. You could walk from the side that stayed where it was, you could walk on the roof of the second story buildings that had been on the other side. Simply amazing. Talk about mountains falling and trembling. And God is powerful. He's mighty. There's a place called Brown's Inlet at the harbor in Anchorage. There's a big park up there. We used to go there all the time to play and goof off. About 150 to 200 feet from the harbor to Brown's Inlet, the top up there where the park is. When, it, when the earthquake hit, the water in the harbor 
came up on top of Brown's Inlet up there and flooded the park. It's amazing. Our God is powerful. He wants to change the layout of the land because of his anger and presence with it. He can do it. Okay. It's amazing power. Okay. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? Any ideas? No one can do that, right? You wouldn't want to be. We all talk about how we're going to act when we get into God's presence. But if, even again from some of yesterday's story and all that stuff, you look through the scriptures, most of the time when people meet God's angels, not even God himself, what do they do? What's the scriptural reference for people? Huh? Where are they at? Up here like this? Oh no, the angel comes, they're down here like this. Flat on the face, on the ground. I can't stand in the face of that. Ain't no way. That's too high and mighty for me. We think ourselves, uh, much more of ourselves in our arrogance. If we think we can stand in the presence of the Almighty God. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows those who trust in Him. That's our refuge right there, right? That's our refuge. But that would be the question for Nineveh and Nahum speaking to and to the people of Judah who are getting this letter, right? In verse 7, if you really want to be good in God's sight, you know, God is good. He's our stronghold. But do you trust Him? He knows those who trust Him. But with an overflow, overflowing flood, He will make an utter end of its place and darkness will pursue His enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble and fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Pretty harsh picture of Nineveh, right? But they're basically plotting against God. They think they are God and they're working against him. God says in verse 12, Though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. Who do you think he's talking about there? Verse 12 and 13, he's really giving hope to Judah, right? You've known the terror of Nineveh. The nation of Assyria has put you under their thumb. You've known the trouble that they've caused. But I'm going to release you from that. Would that have brought hope to Judah? A smile to the face of many and just about everybody probably would have been happy about that for seeing. The Lord has given a, great, or given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetu per perpetuated no longer out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. That's God's description of Nineveh now. We'll speak of theirs. There's a mention of lions. That was one of their gods and stuff, how great they were. Uh, and just like the nation of Egypt, when God had to tell them, they gave the plagues, right? Ten different plagues, different gods that Egypt had saying, ah, can they hold up against me? Nope. Number one can't. Number two can't. Number three, all the way out. Nothing can hold up against me. I will show you that your gods are nothing compared to me. And God's telling them the very same thing. Behold in the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts. Perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. You think Judah was able to keep up with their feasts as dictated by God's law while Assyria was in charge? No. Couldn't do all the feasts, right? God had had several feasts, three of which at least required everybody to come to Jerusalem, right? To go through. Couldn't keep up with all that while Nineveh was in charge and Assyria was, per, was perplexing them. So God says, you're going to be able to keep appointed feasts. We're going to get rid of the people that are bothering you. 
He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches. In the day of his preparation, the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. It gets pretty descriptive in his pictures of the battle. And people were amazed. That's, yeah, did Nahum ever visit Nineveh? Did he really know what Nineveh looked like and stuff? Because of some of the descriptions he gives. Don't know. I never found anything in my reading that says Nineveh, that Nahum ever went there. God could give him a picture of what was around Nineveh and what he needed to say, right, and go on. But all this is pretty accurate about how Nineveh was and how the people were. Uh, people wondered about their chariots, you know, did they really have, you know, lights and stuff on them with them? And the, the general feeling I got from my reading was that uh, they were probably just shiny metal. And the metal, uh, and light, some of the lights around and the sun and stuff would seem like, you know, they were torches and stuff like that and maybe like lightning but they were very fast moving around so it's just talking about how the war is there but so much you know they're made red they got so much blood and stuff on things pretty pretty harsh picture uh, it's another picture I guess to say that you know I mean I heard while I was in the military and other things that I'm a chicken of sorts, if you will. That's one reason I went to submarines, you know. Don't see a lot of that ugliness and stuff in a submarine. And man, if you, if you get sunk, you're already hundreds of feet underwater. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Can't drink all that water. You're just done, you know. But I, I had a brother that went to Iraq, Iran area and stuff. And I mean, he, all he says is, yeah, it was, it was ugly. He won't talk about some of the stuff he saw and some of the things he did. And his job over there was Air Force supply. He wasn't one carrying a gun out in the middle. He was, he was support, and it was still that ugly. And he, he remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are open. The palace is dissolved. It is, de it is decreed she shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. It's a picture Nineveh probably didn't want to see. Nineveh thought could never happen, right? Somebody could actually get in here. Someone could actually breach our walls, breach our city, and come in and attack us. Understanding from my reading and stuff, the Medes and Persians did that. They waited for the rainy season. Uh, all these rivers right here coming in and the way the walls ran, they waited for that season to come and the rivers raised up. Well, then they could use that water to their advantage. They redirected that river, K-H-O-R, Kor, however you say that river, actually passed through part of the gates of the city. And so its river, its level in the water could be redirected from outside the city. You didn't have to get into the city to redirect it. And the Medes and the Babylonians did that. At high water level, they redirected the flow of that river back into the city. And it's dirt around it, right? So make it on a mountain going there. So the river, the river flow and all that was able to start eroding, breaking down. So that helped break down the walls, helped raise the water level in town to flood some of the stuff. That's one of the tools they used in their actual capture of Nineveh and some of the physical structures around it and going. They help you go back and all that kind of stuff and look at King Hezekiah and Israel and stuff when the Assyrians were attacking him. One of the projects he did and all this stuff was actually redirecting. He built another wall on Jerusalem actually redirected part of the river flow to protect the city of Jerusalem, their water flow and from that river being used against them. So it's interesting the way God's picture in his story what he tells the scripture share some of the same kind of information in another picture and how Jerusalem used it to protect themselves 
Nineveh thought they were all right, but the Babylonians came in and used that natural, uh, I guess, advantage for a city, right? But then the Babylonians and Medes that came in used it against them to help capture the city. So, though so Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The hearts melt, the knees shake, much pain is on every side, and all their faces are drained of color. Not a pretty picture, huh? To people who never thought that could happen. And now some of the things that they did to people are coming right back on their own lap. The way they disdain people, the way they mistreated human beings, they're having to experience themselves. Now talk to their God here. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion walked and the lioness and the lion's club and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lioness, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and your voice, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. You trust in those lions, your God of the lion? Nah, I'm going to trash that. It's gone. How would you like to be the one where God says, Behold, I am against you? Is that a phrase you'd like to have God utter in your way? Really think back and think of all the capabilities our God has, of all the power that's at his call, to have him come out and say, I am against you, would put you in a pretty lousy position. Huh? But that's what God says to the city of Nineveh. Not one that we ever really want to have uh, read to us. In chapter 3, Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victims never departs. The noise of the whip and the noise of the rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Again, behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Who shall or where shall I seek comforters for you? Pretty ugly picture, right? It's how destructive it's going to be because you have been so ugly to people. You were vile. I will now make you vile. And I will make you a spectacle to the world that everybody can see. This is what happens to people who don't listen to what I say. This is what happens to people who are continually ugly don't know anything about justice, don't know anything about values, about how to treat human beings, this is where you'll end up. Are you better than no Amun? That's Thebes. We went down, we showed you again. That's the town in Egypt, right down here in Upper Egypt, where the Valley of the Kings was. They were on the east side of the Nile. This picture doesn't really go down far enough, so the Nile splits off, but they were right up here. And then these, this is all becomes all mountainous, this part of the desert, if you will. So Thebes was set up against the mountains on one side and the Nile on the other and considered themselves uh, inconquerable. But they had waters around her whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. It was boundless. Put in Lubim uh, were your helpers. That's considered the uh, people I read and all that stuff of Lydia. Or Lydia. <laughs> Anyway, town of the nations here and then to the side of them. They helped Egypt and supported them to go. But 
Yet she was carried away. So no woman was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You will also seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they will fall in the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are made wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the, bo the bars of your gate. Draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the built kin, the brick kiln, uh, and the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. If you, if, if it will eat you up like a locust. Just not a pretty picture at all of everything being destroyed. Milk, make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered in the mountains and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually." Nobody's a bit sad that Assyria is now conquered, that Nineveh is destroyed. All anybody can do is rejoice. That's how bad Nineveh made life for everybody else. That when they pass, everybody's happy. Everybody's exhilarated to say those people who were so vile and ugly are destroyed. They're getting what they deserve. What can we get out of Nineveh? The story from Nahum. Why do you think it's in here? Why would God give a, I mean, a book that's all that's there. There's no mention of real love, kindness, right? It's all about how ugly Nineveh is and the fact that Nineveh is going to be wiped out because of that behavior. I think it's here, if one, tell us God rules over the nations, right? Even when, now we may think we, we've had to wait for this long you even got the picture in, in Revelation, right? Where the people who were injured, if you will, killed because of their faith in Christ, they're crying out from under the altar saying, how long, how long? We can get in that kind of shape too when there's powers over us and, and some of their policies and their actions are ugly and make life pretty tough. We would probably wonder that too. Well, God, how long do I have to wait with this? How long do I have to suffer? Well, we need to know that God's still in charge of the nations. God's still in charge of men everywhere. And the vileness of men will be recompensed. At some point in time, if people choose to live apart from His guidance and His ideas about how kind we ought to be to each other, the love we ought to have for ourselves and how, I mean, there, there are common decencies, we may call them, right? There are values that ought to be pretty normal for human beings and how we treat each other. But if we choose not to live that way, you're going to have to give an answer to God at some point. God eventually will rule over that and, and say, that, you know, that's not enough. You're gonna, you will meet me in my anger, if you will, because of the way you chose to live. We as God's people still have to maintain where we are though, right? Just because people are angry and people are ugly, does that give us the right to be ugly? No, our challenge is still to be God's people, right? Even in the midst of that ugliness. Even in the midst of people who hate us and mistreat us. And we're told that if we desire to live a godly life, troubles might come, right? Right? Is that what Scripture says? It's not what it says, right? That might be one of those verses that we conveniently choose not to read very often, right? Or if you, I mean, the old sermon, you've probably seen one of those, you probably comes through it, starts ripping pages out of the Bible. Ah, that might be one of those you choose to rip out, right? 
That's what God says. If you choose to live in godliness, if you choose to live righteously, you will suffer persecution. Okay? One to go with. I grant freely that it costs little to be a mere outward Christian. A man who has only got to attend a place of worship twice on Sunday and to be tolerably moral during the week, and he has gone as far as thousands around him ever go in religion. All this is cheap and easy work. It entails no self-denial or self-sacrifice. If this is saving Christianity and will take us to heaven when we die, we must alter the description of the way of life and write, Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to heaven. Is that the way it reads in Matthew? Hmm. Don't think so. Not what it reads. But it does cost something to be a real Christian, according to the standard of the Bible. There are enemies to overcome, battles to be fought, sacrifices to be made, an Egypt to be forsaken, a wilderness to be passed through, a cross to be carried, a race to be run. Conversion is not putting a man in an armchair and taking him easily to heaven. It's the beginning of a mighty conflict in which it costs much to win the victory. Hence rises the unspeakable importance of counting the cost. That's a question. hundred years before Nahum speaks, Nineveh repented. Under Jonah's preaching, they said, yep, what God is saying is right. We need to change our ways. But, a hundred years later, where are they? They've returned to the ugliness. They've returned to not walking in God's values. And God comes now with Nahum to say, that's enough. Everything you do is vile. I can't stand the way you treat people. I'm just going to wipe you out. Twice there he tells them, I am against you. Is that the words we want? Hasn't been a hundred years for us since we said that we would follow Christ. But from whatever day that was, if we are Christians, from whatever day that was, that we fell on our face before God and said, I repent. I acknowledge who I am and I need to be made new by you. Now we went through baptism and arose. Are we any deeper into God? Any more deeply in love with God now than we were then? Or are some of the things we allow ourselves to do, some of the activities we engage in, the same now as they were then? And we just somehow rationalize, make excuses for ourselves, and think it's all right. That would make us question to say, have I counted the cost of what it means to be a Christian? Have I counted the cost of what it means to really follow Jesus the way he said follow Jesus? Follow me. When he called his first disciples and all that stuff, he didn't, you know, he basically, first three or four half off, they're fishermen. He didn't call them to just set your boats up there. We'll come back later, right? His call was, leave it. I will make you fishers of men. It tells a parable there in Matthew and stuff coming through too, though. So, and with no, not trying to make it look pretty, basically, in my opinion, being very serious, when he tells people, count the cost. Following me will cost you. Are you willing to count the cost? Nineveh wasn't. They went back. They weren't willing to pay the price of what it was to really follow God and really apply His laws to their life. So they get destroyed. They get wiped out. We have a choice to learn now and say, it's one for us, I think. Why Nahum's here for us to go through? Why such an ugly story? Good reminder to us, God is still there, God's in charge, and we have to answer for our lifestyle. Is our lifestyle vile enough that it makes God say, I hate your lifestyle, I am against you? Have we really submitted? Have we really counted the cost? 
are really walking God's ways all the time. Let's be people under His Lordship. If you would, let's pray, please. Father, thank You for the story of Nahum. Thank You, Father, for that You are a God of justice, a God of love. And we thank You, Father, that You have shared a story with us to tell us that we need to, uh, to be serious about our walk with You. And when we say we repent, Father, when we say we change our ways, that we need to be consistent. We need to make that something that will last, Father, in the way we go. We ask you, Father, for mercy. We ask you to forgive us, Father, the ways that we have uh, not been diligent in developing our faith and seeking to know you better and allowing you to form within us the heart and the mind of Jesus. Uh, Father, we know that you are the one who deserves the glory and not us. So we ask you, Father, to humble us in your sight. Uh, help us, Father, be willing to accept your lordship and then allow, Father, us to reveal in you and see what you can do as you change us, as you bring your heart to our heart and show yourself glorious in us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. God bless you as you shine as his people.